you here for our April peer learning community. While we're trickling in and waiting for the rest of the folks to join us, we'd love to engage you in some reflection and would love to hear from you in the chat. So please feel free to drop in the chat any questions, comments, or lingering thoughts that you have about the industry-specific pre-work that we provided to you. Um, we'll go ahead and note those and try to address any question by the end of today's session. So if you have anything that's in your head about any of the pre-work that you had, we'd love to hear about it so we can integrate it into the conversation. So we'll just give you a few minutes to do that and check in on where we're at. Still got a couple people coming in. Let's see if we've got anything populating in the chat here. Just a welcome from Christina. Thank you, Christina. Again, as you're joining, um, if you want to add anything into the chat the, surrounding the pre-work that you were provided, we'd love to hear any questions, comments, or any thoughts that you have. Um, we want to make sure that we're integrating those ideas into the conversation. And you can go ahead and feel free to add those um, as they come up, if they come up. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. We have a packed agenda as usual and a lot of really exciting, great information coming your way today um, with our friends at Bank Street. And this is our final peer learning community with them. So we're going to suck we're going to suck up all of the great information like little sponges. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tara. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so yeah, we do have a packed agenda. You can see it on this uh, slide here. We're going to start with a whole group check-in. Um, and then we're going to go to looking at the first uh, assignment from your homework, the mentor cost calculator, and just thinking a little bit more about how to use that tool. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about braiding and layering funding so we can maximize opportunities. And then, as always, we like to give you plenty of time in your small groups. Um, so we're going to do a small group activity where you'll be able to share your um, experiences with funding and any of the challenges that have been coming up. Um, and then finally, of course, we'll close out. It is our last session, um, but we're still around for more office hours. So we're excited for that. On the next slide, you'll be able to see our objectives for today. Um, so you've seen how we're going to meet these objectives, but our goal for today is to um, help you understand funding needs of high quality ECU apprenticeships and mentorships, um, explore opportunities and pressures across systems um, in order to maximize funding opportunities for our mentors, and then uh, connect with each other about successes and challenges um, around securing funding. All right. So um, like the question before, we're hoping that you kind of give us some of your questions and thoughts and you know your learning goal for today so that we know how to sprinkle um, responses to these ideas throughout our session. Uh, so in the chat, if everybody could take a moment to respond to the question, what is something that you are hoping to uncover about funding your mentorship today? Um, thanks, Christina, for plugging that into the chat. Uh, but this just kind of helps us to understand uh, where your thinking is, what you're wondering about, and um, gives us some room to be able to respond to that throughout the session. I'll give you all a second to do that. All right, so it looks like there's not much happening around what you're looking to uncover um, about funding, but I do think, you know, I'm sure you have lots of questions regarding funding. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and so if there's anything that's broader than just thinking about funding your mentorship, that would also be helpful. Great. So I see some things coming in. Um, we have, we hope to learn about future funding opportunities. 
Um, we have a comment that says we're building on, uh, we're working on building confidence with apprenticeship sites uh, when they ask us about where future funding is coming from. Yes, this is kind of the elephant in the room, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about this um, during the braiding and funding conversation, but it is definitely a challenge when you're dealing with a, a grant um, to put hope and trust in those you're supporting um, that funding will magically appear out of somewhere. Um, and I see a question, are there grant applications we can apply for? That's great for mentorship training. These are all, these help us to understand where you're at, where your mindsets are around this. So this is all very helpful. Okay, so um, we kind of wanted to to start this conversation by talking about like the ideals, because we all know that funding gets really crunchy and you end up sometimes making a lot of compromises, but you can't have an ideal program if you don't start there. You have to really base yourself in what is possible and what you want to do um, to begin with. Um, so we're going to spend some time looking at the cost calculator a minute and talking about what costs need to be considered when you are designing apprenticeship programs. Um, um, so I think that we wanted to really focus on the cost of mentorship because it can be a little bit of a hidden cost, especially in early childhood. Um, the biggest cost of apprenticeship programs, as you all know, is usually the coursework. So you can get all of your attention on figuring out the coursework and then it's done. And then it's like, okay, so we'll just throw some stipends at them and call it a day. And it's really a lot more, um, there has to be some intentionality in it if you want to build something that is sustainable and that is quality. Um, so um, like we've talked about over the past few months, we really, really want to emphasize that in order to build a mentoring program, you have to build in um, supports for mentors, professional learning and professional development, just like someone said in the chat, like, where's that money coming from? And I'm glad that you all are already thinking about that because adult learning is not something that comes intuitively to everybody. This is a specific skill set. It's a specific knowledge set. And just because someone is a great teacher of young children does not mean they'll be a great mentor. So we really need to set time to that. The other thing, um, that a lot of us in the CE field are very familiar with, but some of um, our workforce friends might not be, is that you have to build time into the schedule um, for mentors to meet um, when teachers are not supervising children, um, which usually requires uh, substitute coverage or overtime. And most, most salaried teachers won't be eligible for overtime. And so this might mean requiring buying, getting two substitute teachers for the classroom um, on a regular basis so that your mentor and the apprentice have time to meet together. Um, so that's not only a cost challenge, that's also a logistic challenge, um, but you really have to think about that. And then the last thing is of course, stipends. We want to um, not take for granted that people will do this work. Um, teachers are eager for growth opportunities and they love to help. But I think that we just wanna emphasize that that we really believe that early childhood teachers need to be treated as professionals and compensated as such. Okay, so um, uh, someone is gonna drop in the chat our cost calculator. So you looked at the designing ECE apprenticeship document, uh, which is a longer document and this link is in there. Um, you might have found the link to the cost calculator and played with it already. For those of you who did not, we're going to give you a few minutes to plug in some numbers and see what you come up with. Um, so I just want y'all to play around with this for a few minutes and then um, we will uh, then uh, go into small groups to talk about what you sound. So we're at five minutes here for y'all just to use this link and let us know if you have any difficulties accessing it.
We have about one more minute and then we're gonna put y'all into small groups. I'm so sorry. I've been having a problem with my Zoom for a second and I'm just now joining. Can you tell me where to find the cost calculator that you're looking at? Oh yeah, I will copy it and, oh, Christina dropped it in the chat again. Thank you so much. Sure. Would it be possible for me to see the previous slide real quick? Thank you. All right. Um, so ECIC friends, um, let's give them 10 minutes in this small group instead of five. I'm sorry for changing it, but we got a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, so we will give you 10 minutes to break into groups and talk about what this expiration sparks, what you notice and what you are wondering. Um, there will be a link in the chat to something called a Padlet. Um, it's like if you're familiar with Google Jamboard or any other interactive whiteboard, um, you just click on the plus sign at the bottom to add a post, and then you can move the post anywhere you would like on the board. Um, you guys will be able to see the stuff that everyone is doing at the same time from all the groups. Um, so um, uh, Christina dropped that in the chat. And without further ado, um, you have fun in your small groups. or with some further ado, because I changed the time. <laughs> Nicole, oh. All right, well, I hope you all had time to really start playing with that. We saw one comment in the um, the the on the Padlet that said, the cost calculator is very comprehensive. Our early stage as apprenticeship sees some of these categories as aspirational. I would love to be able to get into that a little bit, but um, we are gonna keep moving. So if you have not, and most of you have not, had a chance to note your group's comments in the Padlet, um, then go ahead and do so now. And I am also now going to turn it over to Tara. Great, thank you. All right, so I have the very interesting topic of funding and um, braiding and layering funding to talk with you all about. Um, the idea is that unfortunately, it doesn't really look like there's going to be a huge pot of funding that is specially earmarked for EC apprenticeships. Um, but y'all aren't quitters. We know that. So today we're going to kind of move beyond the urge to lean into a scarcity mindset and instead really start to think about how we can maximize funding opportunities. Um, so braiding and layering funding essentially is um, the idea of using multiple funding streams as a process um, in order to create a more comprehensive approach to a project like apprenticeship. Um, you all are likely to be doing this already um, in the field, right? So we see this in a lot of different um, workforce entities. We see this at intermediaries and early childhood folks are um, braiding and blending regularly. 
Um, but before I go into logistics about this, I'm just wondering if anyone is currently braiding or um, layering funding. Doesn't have to be for this specific um, apprenticeship pathway. Um, it could be any apprenticeship pathway or anything else in your work um, that would be able to help, um, we would be able to share as like an example of how you're doing that. Um, so if so, I invite you to put that into the chat. Um, I also just wanna point out that I am not an economist. I am also not a state officer. Um, so the, the conversation today is really just about inspiring some collaborative thinking and pulling ideas from different places. Um, every funding stream has its own rules and regulations. Um, and so thinking about our long-term um, opportunities in, will require some um, creativity, and that's our goal for this process. It's not for me to kind of give you a recipe for the different ways we might be able to do that. Great. All right. So what is braiding? Um, so if you can imagine different funding strands, each representing a different source of funding. So this is the first picture you see, the first layer, the second layer, the third layer. Um, they engage one another in order to build something that's stronger um, and broader. So each strand remains its own distinct, has its own distinctive, distinct Effectiveness, um, but contributes to a unified approach to funding the apprenticeship. Uh, this happens a lot in ECE. We see this at the local level in child care programs where um, savvy employers might take Head Start funding, state preschool dollars, and child care subsidies in order to be able to offer a more holistic approach for families, right? So they're not just serving one, one pot of, or like one funding stream, but they're serving families from their community that could fit into multiple different funding streams. Um, layering, the example I have here is the layered cake, which looks delicious. Um, but layering funding is like braiding, but instead of combining the different strands, you're actually adding layers on top of one another. Um, so each layer represents a different funding source um, and they build upon one another in order to support the program. So each layer can serve a specific purpose or address a particular need within the overall funding structure. Um, so here's an example, right? So um, CCDF dollars are often used in states to cover tuition for, a, for um, our incumbent workforce or early educators who have been in the field. A lot of times there's like requirements that might say they have to be working full-time for six months. Um, so if you're eligible for that funding, you can use that to, you know, go through your apprenticeship pathway and cover your RSI dollars. Um, but ultimately what we're trying to do is also not just um, upskill the folks who are here in the field, but also bring in new folks to the profession. Um, so you can layer on additional funding like SNAP um, employment training dollars and potentially open up opportunities to our youth who are who could be you know aspiring to join the profession. Um, we can use TANF dollars in order to help un, underemployed or unemployed parents um, to find a pathway. And so this is one way to kind of use layered funds in order to, um, you know, keep each of those different funding streams accountable to their own reporting mechanisms, but then also allow us to serve a broader population. Um, and so separately, um, I'm looking in the chat, I can see that many of you are talking about how you've been doing this. Um, I can see that there's the blending of um, two grants, which is great. It's always really helpful. Um, SAE 2020, which I have no idea what that is. Um, ECIC, which I'm assuming is a grant, and ABA, which also no idea what that is. So I'm really, <laughs> you know, so my non-economist is showing, but this looks like a really um, comprehensive approach. Um, braiding WIOA with grants, great, and going pro talent fund and other programs, perfect example. Um, and then Kelly is sharing that we serve as an intermediary and have almost 40 different apprenticeship occupations that utilize braiding and funding with WIOA. Yeah. I mean, the workforce entities are like experts in this. Um, and so I think this is a great opportunity for us. Um, so the 
the challenge is, um, like separately, we might all be doing this, um, but what does it mean to build a cohesive and integrated, integrated approach across systems, right? It's not quite as simple. And I've talked a lot about this previously, right? We're all trying to learn each other's language, figure out exactly what resources everybody has available, um, and then learn how to collaborate and work with one another. Thank you, Nicole, S -E, uh, S A E State Apprenticeship Expansion Grant. Perfect, great. So it sounds like there's a lot of great funding through um, grants right now, which is a great way to alleviate some of the stress that's associated with funding. Um, but I can understand now where a lot of the tension around longevity and sustainability is coming into place. Um, okay, so when we're talking about grading and layering funding across systems, it does get more complicated. Um, so an example of being able to fund an apprenticeship program across systems could look like this, right? So again, you use the CCDF dollars for the tuition, um, and that would work for the folks who have been um, in the field previously and are upskilling. Um, but we know that tuition isn't the only barrier to completion, right? There's a lot of reasons why um, folks haven't been able to achieve a degree with just tuition alone. Um, but when we work across our industries and collaboratively, we can um, identify additional ways to fund a more holistic approach. Um, so the example I came up with was using career and tech funds um, to help you know, cover local um, community-based organizations that can offer on-site mentorship. So now you have the tuition covered, you have um, some incentive for the mentor and some professional development that could potentially be covered for the mentor by using a different funding stream. And then of course there's Perkins 5, right? And Perkins 5 can be accessed by the RSI or the college in order to better think through what an innovative competency-based pathway might be for early educators. Um, and then this increases the relevancy and the accessibility of the coursework, which in turn means, you know, apprentices are more engaged, employers are happier with the outcome of their education, and everybody's more likely to be retained. Um, and then, of course, there's always Pell Grants, which could offer the apprentice additional cash flow, um, which can help them with some of the costs that are associated with being, um, being associated, enrolled, being associated while they're in college, like, Quick, fam uh, quick dinners for their family on the night that they have classes or car shares to get to and from the campus or to wherever classes are being held. Um, maybe it's to be able to afford reliable internet. Um, so again, we're serving the same amount of students in this example, but we're wor working across industries and partnerships in order to better support a more holistic approach. So that's another example of braiding and funding, I'm sorry, braiding and layering funding. All right, so how do we approach this from the idea, and I'm almost done talking, I promise, um, <laughs> but how do we approach this from the idea of working across um, offices, entities, all across our partnerships? Um, so we start with the obvious thing, right? Bringing stakeholders together. Um, you had to have some partners in order to apply for this grant, your RSI partner, an employer, workforce boards, um, but also think about stakeholders um, that might be, you know, not engaged at this moment. There could be large um, employers in your area that need their employees to have access to quality child care. Um, and therefore, they would be motivated to think about investing in uh, ECU apprenticeship that would help um, grow available slots. Um, Perhaps there's local philanthropy, perhaps there's community-based uh, organizations that are already being funded to do adult, it could be adult basic ed, it could be coaching and mentoring. You know, there's a lot of things at the local level that are really um, accessible, and that's a quick and easy way to kind of build those relationships and start to find, as we talked about in our first session, that shared vision and the shared goals moving forward. Um, your next step to being able to do that would really be um, looking at, at identifying all available funds. 
Um, so I like to think about this as like inventorying what is currently available. So not only just looking at this, um, but really doing a deep dive, even what's available in ACE. So when I look at the chat, I can see we have WIOA funding, Pro Talent. There's a couple of different things, a couple of different grants. There's lots within the workforce world, but then also what is available to the early childhood educators? Because we know CCDF also helps to cover some expenses there. Um, and is there a way to kind of chart out all of the available funds? And then from there, start to compare requirements and eligibility. Um, of course, we always want this to be the easiest on the end user. Um, we don't want to have to have our apprentices not only navigating school for the first time, but then also going and seeking, you know, this partner requires them to fill out this paperwork and that paperwork. Um, but after you compare requirements and eligibility, you can best determine what pot of funds are we going to use for this? Um, what pot of funds would be better used over here? Um, and then, of course, last but not least, by any means, is building that integrated approach. Um, so streamlining the funding, like I said, is really critical for the end user. But for that to take place, all of the partners will need to be on the same page. Um, there'll need to be the idea of establishing a protocol that can help. Um, and this could be as formal or as loose as you need it to be. If it's happening at the local level, it could be verbal agreements. Sometimes um, folks have put um, memorandums of understanding into place, um, but there has been a lot of um, intermediaries who have kind of served as the direct person who acts with the apprentice or the mentor and then takes back the information to the whole partnership about what is what funding is needed and it's kind of behind the scenes where those those dollars get accessed all right so now that you've heard me talk a little bit about braiding and layering um we're really curious about what dollars you've currently been using and you put some into the chat but we also want you to be thinking about what dollars um, might be available, right? So not just like what you're already using, but also starting to think through what dollars could possibly be available? Like which dollars have you been curious about? And we're gonna use the Padlet for this as well because we wanna document this um, because like in the previous slide, this is our opportunity to identify all available funds. Um, and again, then the, the lift will really be at the local level and amongst your partnerships to figure out, you know, where these funds might fit into your pathway. All right, so the link to the Padlet is in the chat. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. All right, and um, just in case you you had a hard time before, I just want to point out there's at the bottom of the um, screen after you open the Padlet, there's like a little purple plus circle, and that's what you would click on in order to be able to add more information. Um, so you can be adding anything that you know is currently available something you are definitely using or um, funding that you're curious about. I can see little dots, so I know folks are working on that. Um, I see more um, different funding streams up top that we can also think about adding. Let's go see them. All right, curious about additional funding streams. So which ones are you, if you're curious about additional ones, which ones are currently being used? Sustainability through partnership with other programs who have funding to provide wraparound services. That's great. So wraparound services are 
um, a great way to start thinking about, um, you know, supporting the more holistic approach to the apprenticeship. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that I've seen examples of folks being able to pull down um, computer funds, hotspots, scrubs through workforce dollars, like clothes that people needed to wear. Um, also, if you're from early childhood, I encourage you to think about, you know, the funding that might be available through the state system. I believe that there's TEACH. Um, is there other resources or funding opportunities that exist within the registry we can be thinking about? Um, are there, you know, dollars within Head Start budgets that we can be thinking about? Um, and then the other thing that I think would be helpful as we're kind of trying to support a cross systems approach is like when we're talking about we owe a path and youth dollars, like what are we using to fund that with? Like, where are the we owe a dollars going to? Is that going to staff? Is that going to stipends? Like, what are we using that for? The goal here is really just to make sure we're kind of creating a whole inventory of what's available out there. Thank you, um, Upper Peninsula Michigan Works, for adding uh, more information and and uh, you're identifying like identifying who you are is great. In case we have additional questions, we can follow up with you. Mioa on the job training, right? So we always say in early childhood that we have the alphabet soup um, because we use acronyms all of the time. Um, and so it's helpful to see that this isn't just unique to us. Um, this cl <laughs> clearly is a, the acronym soup is something that goes across industries. I can see we have, yeah, Mioa, ITA, BRES, so these are all good things. We're going to do a small group activity where you'll have a chance to um, talk about some of these things a little bit more deeply. All right. So I think this gives us something to get started with. Um, we have you going into small groups to kind of ask questions. We thought maybe in smaller groups, it would be more likely that you would um, want to engage one another and ask questions like the silly ones I have asked, like what is B-R-E-S, um, so that you can kind of get a feel for um, what's available, what's out there. Um, so keep this Padlet open and we're going to put you into small groups for, let me see exactly how long. Looks like we can do 20, 20 minutes still. Yeah. Great. All right. And feel free to keep adding, like as you're talking, if more things pop up, feel free to add them to this. We want to be able to share this at the end of today's session so that you all have like a record of different funding that folks are using. And if you're feeling like you would be willing to be a supportive um person for somebody to reach out to, to ask questions about how you're pulling certain funding down. Also, um, feel free to write where you're from. So um, your fellow learning community partners would know who to reach out to with additional questions. All right. Thank you, Sable. I think we're ready for small groups. Any questions before we go into small groups, actually? I just wanted to add that I will change the permissions on that that Padlet so that if you were more comfortable writing questions or adding things underneath funding, then you were able to do so. Perfect. As a comment. Great. 
All right, does anybody else have any questions? Great, all right, looks like we're ready for small groups. We'll see you in 20. Welcome back. I'm, I'm not sure if you all saw the broadcast message, but we have asked each group to identify uh, one person from the group to share out what your group talked about. Um, so uh, who is going to be the brave soul to go first about their group? Great. Thank you, Sebastian. All right. Um, so we talked about quite a lot of different things with our 20 minutes, um, but just to go over a few of them, um, one of the victories we were, or I guess the start of the challenges, one challenge we started with talking about was that resources um, can be a very regional thing. So it is really helpful to learn about like the names of different funds that are available and things of that nature. Um, but with the caveat that you really have to explore what's actually available region specifically. Um, that ties onto the victory that we talked about though, which is that um, with the Michigan Works funding stream specifically, um, having a good relationship uh, with your Michigan Works navigator uh, locally uh, is a big win because they're very knowledgeable about funding in their area, um, how it relates specifically to your specific case. Um, and so we talked about how like, yes, it's a challenge, but it also um, works out quite well um, once you start having those conversations. And the other thing we talked about as a challenge, and this is, I feel this like both on the like applying for funds and the reporting side is the feeling that we have where we're like kind of backfilling in some cases. And what we mean by that was like, it's difficult to ask for funding for these like workforce issues but then there are other challenges that like undermine parts of your, uh, there are other challenges with an ECE broadly that can sometimes threaten to or undermine aspects of your project. So when we're looking at like, for example, a big metric for us is retention. Um, you know, how much of the retention is uh, attribu attributable to the apprenticeship program, or let's say someone leaves, was that attribu attributable to the apprenticeship program or their program? And how do we start to, um, yeah, work on, work on getting those things a bit more in alignment and maybe getting, uh, maybe that's an area for braided support, like retention broadly, apprenticeship might be a strategy within that. So that, that's what we talked about. Thank you, Sebastian. And I will say, I noticed that most, that means that all of the things in this group came from two groups. So if your group is not represented on the Jamboard, I would just encourage you, actually, I'm going to ask that, uh, that you all take a few moments to fill that in. Um, with that said, um, who is our reporter from room two? This robust comment we got from Michigan Works. Cassidy, this is you. I can, I think we missed that part, that note, so we didn't agree on it. If anybody else from room two really wants to talk, I will hand it over to you. You got it, Cassidy. <laughs> okay. Um, well, several, a couple of us in there were from Michigan Works. So we were talking about this from a workforce development standpoint. And a lot of what Michigan Works does sort of philosophically is help fill the gap at the end. So by the time we have a lot of people coming to us, they have exhausted or we've helped them exhausted or their training or maybe their employer has helped them exhaust whatever other funding options they have, whether that be like financial assistance or scholarships from their um, uh, training provider or educator. So that's going to be really dependent on just what's regionally available for them. Or maybe it's um, like from the teach scholarship or other funding that their employer helped them find. Um, and then once they come to their work, the workforce development board can help them do is a sort of last, last effort to close the gap between what they have already and what they still need, whether that be covering the cost of tuition and training or other supportive services like uh, transportation needs or um, not sure what exactly my I've been working a lot with the my reach grant so I'm thinking of stethoscopes but early childhood education wouldn't really need a stethoscope but whatever kinds of materials they need to be able to complete their training textbooks that sort of thing um and I think somebody had asked about what BRES means that breeze funding and I'm wait I just looked up what it, the actual acronym means but it's burial removal and employment success but that funding is very very flexible funding that the Michigan works um organizations have that can be used to help with those kinds of uh, supportive services like transportation or textbooks or the other weird things. And it has a lot less um, 
guess, red tape around it. So that's like very magical fund funding that we can use to help really remove some of those barriers uh, if it's needed at the end there. Thank you, Jesse. I will just say that you said burial, but I heard barrier. Sorry, barrier, but no, you said barrier, and I heard burial, and I was like, wow. We stopped really, us. We're really getting creative. <laughs> burial, remember? Burial's needed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. All right, which group is going to go next? I'll go for group one. We talked about the TEACH grant, of course, the Michigan Connect mm -hmm. grant. And we, we also talked about the SAE grants that are available. Those are different depending on what Michigan works that are covered. FAFSA is another option. And then the Perkins 5, working with CTE programs. Great, thank you so much, Wanda. All right, we've got two more groups. Who's gonna share next? I can go for our group. I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> I was with Amy and Heidi. Um, we, you know, a lot of what everyone else has already mentioned, but something else we had discussed was the eligibility to receive the grant funding, especially for training funding and how um, there may be funds out there and they may be available in our area, but the actual apprentice or mentor may not be eligible for them based on grant criteria. Um, and you know, how, how that goes, how we address that as well. Thank you, Karen. That is, it's so frustrating in some cases where you get like right up to the point and you're just assuming that they're eligible and then you're like, Oh, nope, this money's not available to you. We got to make another plan. So, um, thank you so much. All right. We have one more group who hasn't shared yet. Who would like to share from that group? This is Kelly. I can share for group three. We kind of echo everything that everyone else had said. And I kind of um, would say with what Cassidy had mentioned is kind of we were representing um, three of us, Michigan Works agencies. So um, really just kind of being that last resort of exhausting all of the other funding from, you know, the education resources, um, any other Pell or FAFSA, those types of things, and then coming in kind of last with whatever support that we can offer. Um, and then echoing everybody else on kind of the CTE programs and looking at that being a stair step um, into this occupation um, and looking at different youth um, funding and, um, you know, kind of partnerships that we can create to uh, add more funding as available. Thank you. It sounds like you all had really robust conversations and I'm glad that this, uh, that you were able to have that time. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tara. Hey, thank you for that. Um, okay, so we're in the home stretch now and um, my job now is to kind of mirror back some of the things that we've been hearing and help you to think about um, potential leverage points that um, might still exist. Um, so the one thing I did want to make a note on was the idea around retention, because this is a big challenge with ECE apprenticeships is thinking about, you know, how do we measure quality in our pathways? Um, and sometimes when we're upskilling early educators, they're exploring how children learn and they're doing a lot of reflection on like what good practices look like, but then also like what philosophies jive with who they want to be and how they want to show up in a classroom. And sometimes that there's a disconnect between their current employer and an employer that like does. And so maybe they leave that employer. It doesn't mean they leave the field. So we're so one of the things just to kind of keep in the back of your head is like, are they, are we retaining them in the profession or are we retaining them at this specific employer? Um, so, you know, I know it's a, it's a challenging conundrum for us, um, but that is, I think one lens to use with it is, you know, it, it can take a long time for educators to figure out exactly who they want to be in the classroom and then also um, to find a program that mirrors that. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of just um, talk through a little bit was the idea of like helping us to help you, right? So in early childhood, we're no, we're no strangers to advocating. Um, there's, you know, we're not always wildly um, self-organized, but we have 
gotten most of what we've gotten through advocacy. Um, and so if early educators are more aware of opportunities and ways that they're being excluded from funding, they are also a little bit more flexible, especially as employers, in um, pushing back um, and advocating for change. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, this is a profession that is desperate to attract new folks, to get the funding that we need, and um, to move forward with highly qualified and supported educators. So whenever there's an opportunity to learn more about a system that they aren't quite accessing, um, it has been my experience that folks are all ears and they are ready to um, advocate you know, on their behalf in ways that maybe you all aren't comfortable doing or able to do given um, your positions. So keep that in, in your mind as we're moving forward. The other thing I wanna point out is that Department of Labor is really looking to diversify their pool of apprentices. Um, in the past four years, there's been a lot of specialized funding that has come out to kind of support this effort. Um, and also just remembering that the connection for the EC workforce is made up of like 95% plus women. Um, and so, you know, when we think about diversifying pools of apprentice and we look beyond just, um, you know, pulling in women into the construction or, or traditionally um, apprentices, apprenticed um, industries, we can also start to think about really influxing those quotas and numbers and reaching those goals by um, serving the new um, field of ECE. Um, the other thing that we wanted to kind of point out was that, you know, taking advantage of something when, when times are um, specifically challenging for spending is a great time to get your partners to take a chance. Um, and this came up around our conversation around wraparound supports um, and colleges, right? So everybody operates on a fiscal year. There's always pressure to spend down, spend down. Um, and so at this point in the year, depending upon, you know, what your structure is, there's a lot of opportunities that people might say yes to funding certain things that they might not say, let's say, in the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, so just kind of thinking about being able to demonstrate need um, and knowing uh, when to kind of strike while the iron is hot is also a great advantage. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is um, there was a learning circle a couple of years ago of um, early childhood apprenticeship implementers. And we kind of looked at how those uh, groups, how all of those groups were funding their apprenticeship. Um, and of course, this is not like a complete list of things, but I'm gonna put it into the chat so you can kind of take a look at that. Um, these were all like, and, and like we said earlier, so many decisions are made at the state or the local level, but these were all um, funding streams that somebody somewhere was being able to pull down. So if they're new to you, if you're just starting to look at them, um, I'm not sure that there's anything that is in addition to what you've been already looking at, um, but you know those are also opportunities. All right. Um, the last thing I just want to point out is that the mentor guide has a section on funding um, and two of the questions are what resources have we not considered and how do we know we are maximizing funding across systems, which we hope we've helped you to do today. We hope we've at least opened some thinking around that. Um, and even though this is our last community of practice, um, that document remains yours along with the, um, the Google Drive that we have, all of the resources we've covered so far in this COP um, for your access. So feel free to continue to utilize that document um, as you're working through it with your partners. If things pop up and you want to show up to our office hours, that's exactly what those office hours are intended for. Um, the idea is that those are, those are there for us to be able to share um, like space and problem solve together as a group. All right, and on that note, that is what I have. I'm gonna put a closing question into the chat. Um, I think it's actually also on this slide. Yep. Um, we kind of wanna leave you um, with an idea that you feel like 
this group has helped you to accomplish things. Um, and we would like to know a little bit more about um, how you have learned from this community about and what you've learned, um, or I guess what you've learned um, about building a high quality early childhood mentorship. Um, it's just helpful for us to know what aspects were super engaging and how your thinking might have changed over the time. Um, so feel free to take your time to respond to that. And I'm going to pass it over to Christina. Thank you, Tara. So before we all sign off for the day, um, prior to leaving, we just I want to thank everybody first off for joining and all of the collaborative work we've done this session and previous sessions. Uh, prior to leaving, if you could please just go ahead and I'm going to put it in the chat if you can complete the post learning community survey. This will help us for the next couple of learning communities that we have that we need to plan for um, and overall what your experience has been um, given these last ones with Bank Street College of Education. Just a couple of reminders, as Tara already mentioned, we do have the optional monthly office hours taking place next Tuesday, April 23rd at 1 p.m. It is more of an open forum, so you can bring any questions that you might be still wondering about or need additional information on. Um, we do also have the next spending report due at the end of this month on April 30th. And finally, I just want to give a very warm thank you to both Liz and Tara for joining us these last few sessions and for bringing along their expertise and mentorship. Um, it's been really helpful for not only myself, but I'm hoping for everybody else who's been a part of these sessions. So thank you so much. And as always, if you have any further questions or need support, always feel free to reach out to our team here at ECIC. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Cassidy. Bye. Thank you.